We are gathered here in the midst of our own lives, hopes, and needs, and those of God's beloved, broken world. We are gathered for worship in the presence and in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God graces us with the gift of honesty and courage as the baptized followers of Jesus. If we pretend that we are without sin, we are only fooling ourselves and hiding from the truth. But as we confess our sins to the living God and to one another, our faithful and just God will forgive us our sins, cleanse us, and free us to walk in newness of life even now. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess, we admit, and we give to you our sins. We have rejected your ways and your love by our actions, our words, and our thoughts in the things we have done, and in things we have left undone. We are entangled in patterns and systems bigger than ourselves that defy your will, and we are complicit in their rottenness. Despite your fierce will that will not let us go, we have turned from you and failed to love you with our whole selves. Despite your good desire for us to love our neighbors, strangers, and enemies, we have turned from them as well with hardened hearts. Despite your call to be stewards of your good creation, we have failed to care for your world for which we are made. In the midst of these sins, we call on you to forgive us, free us, and turn us around. For the sake of Christ Jesus, your Son and our Lord, renew us so that we may witness to your love and walk in your ways in the midst of your world. Through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and by his authority, we are forgiven. You are forgiven completely, wholly, and freely by the deep mercy of God. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, each of us is set loose to live anew in hope and freedom, even here and now. Amen. We invite you to join in and sing our gathering here for the evening, In a Far Off Place Jesus Comes. Marge and I will do verse 1 first to introduce it to you, and then we'll invite you to join in. We'll take it from the top with verse 1 through 3. Thank you. 
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. We'd like to invite anyone to join us for our song of welcome to help play a percussion to come on up as we get ready to sing Welcome to the Family of God. Any other players want to join us?
Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Stir up your power, Lord Christ, and come. By your merciful protection, alert us to the threatening dangers of our sin. And redeem us for your life of justice. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The congregation will be seated for the reading. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will live in safety. And this is the name by which it will be called, The Lord is our righteousness. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from 1 Thessalonians. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy that we feel before our God because of you? Night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you face to face and restore whatever is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, just as we abound in love for you. And may he also strengthen your hearts in holiness, that you may be blameless before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. The word of the Lord. Amen. The congregation is invited to rise as you are able for the reading of the Gospel. This is the Holy Gospel according to Luke, the 21st chapter. Glory to you, our Lord. Jesus said, There will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and on the earth distress among nations, confused by the roaring of the sea and the waves. People will faint from fear and foreboding of what is coming upon the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to take place, stand up and raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing you. Then he told them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is already near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Be on guard, so that your hearts are not weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of this life, and that day does not catch you unexpectedly like a trap. For it will come upon all who live on the face of the earth. Be alert at all times, praying that you may have the strength to escape all these things that will take place and to stand before the Son of Man. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to Jesus Christ. The congregation may be seated. What do you do when your world is breaking? What do you do? How, how does it feel? What, what, what's going on inside you when everything you counted on, everything you thought was solid, the things you like as well as the things you didn't like, but at least the things that were familiar, the devil you know, as opposed to the devil you don't know. What do you do when all that gets shaken to its foundations? My guess is we get scared, we get anxious, we get afraid, we get angry. Sometimes it makes us dig our heels in to want to hold on to whatever's familiar just because it's familiar. Sometimes it makes us nostalgic to remember how things were in our past, maybe better than they actually were, but wanting to fight tooth and nail to hold on to the way we remember it because at least it's familiar, the way we've always known it. How do you feel when the world is breaking? And what happens if what we thought was breaking is actually new creation. Let me tell you a true story, an honest to goodness true story from uh, the Bond family this past week. 
We had the opportunity earlier this week, as often folks do on Thanksgiving, to go visit with different family members. And so, middle of this week, found us uh, visiting Sarah's sister and brother-in-law and their two small kids, a, a daughter and a son, and the gathering of all these sorted other family members. And so there came a moment when our three-year-old nephew was presented a gift by grandparents, a book on dinosaurs. That's like, that, that's like striking gold for a three-year-old boy, right? And he there, he's right in his he loves dinosaur face. And this book wasn't just a picture book of dinosaurs. In the back, it had pages that came out, that sort of pressed cardboard, particle board kind of pages that pulled out that you could make an honest-to-goodness three-dimensional display of the world in the time of dinosaurs and where the different dinosaurs lived on Earth at that time. Oh my goodness, this was exciting stuff. However, However, to create this three-dimensional stand in the world as it was in the time of the dinosaurs, with the little dinosaurs that popped out, you had to pull out pages from the back of the book. And there, laying in front of our three-year-old nephew, four quadrants of the earth, all in the pages that they came in, and you had to pop them out of the paint so you could assemble it. And then like puzzle pieces, you put the four pieces together and pop out the little slots so you could put the dinosaurs with their little tabs in and create your little diorama. So with all of the best intentions, adults and his older sister, who knows everything at the age of five, and their cousins who are in this room tonight, start helping our three-year-old nephew to assemble the world and the four parts, uh, the four puzzle pieces that go together, and they're popping the pages out, and we're uh, pulling the tabs out so the dinosaurs can stick in, and three-year-old nephew says, as if it is the obvious conclusion, no, you're breaking the world. I don't always understand the words that come out of three-year-old's mouth, but this was loud and clear. No, you're breaking the world. And in fairness to this particular three-year-old, all he had ever seen in this book was these are four separate pieces. You're not supposed to pop things out. This is how it came. If you're messing with it, you're breaking it. How many times has every three-year-old heard something like that? If you're messing with things, you're breaking it. And so the logic held in his mind. If you're messing with it, you're breaking it. Before any of us goes too hard on this particular toddler, funny thing, how every last one of us has a way of living in that space as well, taking the world that we are born into, and because it's what we're used to, hearing any talk about the change, about a new creation, about things being different, we get so awfully upset. No, 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 you're breaking the world. When maybe what Jesus is offering today in these last chapters from Luke's Gospel is not something to destroy or harm or threaten, maybe what Jesus is offering is new creation. For anybody who has watched um, any of that genre of movies called disaster movies, or especially end times apocalyptic disaster movies, or anybody who's listened to that strain of religiosity that talks in terms of fire and brimstone at Jesus coming, it can sound like we're supposed to be afraid of Jesus coming again, like it's something we should somehow prevent, or that at the end of the disaster movie everybody figures out a way to avert or delay it's awfully easy to think when Jesus talks about the sun and the moon and the stars being shaken and all the things people think are solid being shaken to their foundations and, and they think, oh my goodness, Jesus, how can we prevent this terrible thing from happening? That sounds like somebody's going to be breaking the world. Jesus doesn't talk that way, does he? Jesus doesn't say, here's how you can avoid the scary things happen. Here's how you can avoid things that you thought were solid being shaken to their foundations. Jesus sees this as the beginning of new Creation. And that's just it. All of us are at some level three-year-old kid who's used to being handed a world that comes in pieces and assuming it's supposed to be broken. We've all grown up in a world where we're just used to the fact some people will go home. We're used to the idea there are going to be some people who are homeless. Yep, that's just how it is. We're used to a world where some people's security and peace comes at the expense of war and death for other people in other places. We're used to an idea where I can have more and more and more and don't have to care about somebody else who's going without, or I don't have to care about somebody else's problems because that's their issue and I've got to look out for me. Man, we're used to a world that's broken. And when Jesus starts daring us to envision a new creation, where wolves and lambs can lie down side by side and nobody has to be afraid of getting eaten. Where people hammer their swords into plowshares. A new creation where peace and justice are at home. It can make us afraid. Can, no, 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 that sounds like you're breaking the world. And what Jesus offers us isn't something to be afraid of as long as our hope is a tethered to all those other structures around us. 
I mean, if your hope is solely in the stock market, yeah, live in fear every time it closes down, or um, be afraid every time the Fed decides whether they will or won't raise interest rates. If your life is pinned on those market kinds of things, yeah, we should live in constant fear of those things being shaken or changing. If our lives are pinned on um, our, our worth by how many degrees we have on the wall or our status or the, the uh, title we have from our employment, if, if our lives are pinned on that, we should be in constant fear because those can be shaken. Yup. But Jesus speaks to us as people whose sense of solidness comes from somewhere else and can trust that as he hands us the pieces of the world and says, watch how I put this together in a new way, we don't have to be afraid of it. We can be hopeful about it. We can be people who live differently because when things get shaken that everybody else has pinned their hopes on, we can be the ones going, oh, Jesus isn't breaking the world. He's making new creation possible. In the new creation, nobody has to go hungry. In new creation, nobody says, that's not my problem because I, I, I don't have to worry about them being my neighbor. In new creation, my safety and security doesn't depend on somebody else living in fear at night. My peace doesn't depend on somebody else living in a war zone. In new creation, all is put right. That's what Jesus is up to, putting the pieces together and making new creation. If we are wedded to things being broken the way we've always known, we're going to get scared when Jesus starts talking about things being shaken and changing. But if we dare to place our trust in Jesus, then you know better than I do, Jesus, what the world needs to look like. You know better than I how to renew creation. And we've got utter freedom and peace as people who live differently who are convinced Jesus' goal is not to throw away this world, but to put things back together the way they are supposed to be, the way they were intended all along, but we, like toddlers, have a way of thinking, no, what I'm used to is the way it's supposed to be, rooting for the brokenness, thinking Jesus mending things is setting things wrong. Jesus dares us to trust that he knows what he's doing. And in the meantime, to be people who live ahead of the curve, people who live in light of that promised future and begin to live now, how Jesus is setting all things to be. So that when you and I become people who reconcile with others, even when the world says, that's a sucker's game trying to forgive somebody else or make amends, just cut your losses and walk away, we're living out of step intentionally, living in light of God's promised future. When we seek out the good of our neighbors, whether they can do something good for us in return, we don't have to say that's, that's foolish nonsense because that's not how the world works in a dog-eat-dog -dog kind of a world. No, we're living ahead of the curve. That's how things are in God's new creation where justice and peace are at home. When you dare to be confident and have hope when everybody else is scared because the markets took a tumble or had a correction or whatever else, you and I are living ahead of the curve, living in light of God's promised future. People who dare to believe what Jesus is up to isn't breaking the world, but putting things right after all. I'm not always one to quote the theology of that lesser-known theologian, Billy Joel, but ever so often. And he says, interestingly enough, in uh, a song from decades, has the good old days weren't always good and tomorrow's not as bad as it seems. That seems to be, to me, an awfully good perspective here for this season of Advent. When it can be so tempting to always look backward to how we imagine things used to be, whether it's the way you imagine what Thanksgiving holidays look like in some glorious time in your memory, or the way culture or your community or jobs or whatever look like in some past time, Maybe we've been remembering things with rose-colored lenses. Maybe we're just so used to things being broken, we assume that's how things are supposed to be. And when Jesus steps in and says, I'm about to make all things new, when you see everything else getting shaken, you don't, you don't need to be afraid. Hold your head up high. Your redemption is drawing you. The kingdom of God is taking shape among us. We can be people of hope, of peace, of joy, and of love, even when everybody else feels like they are losing their heads and worried the sky is falling. That's not going to be because we're out of touch. It's because we dare to trust Jesus to be ahead of the curve. What do you and I do on those days when it feels like our world is breaking? You and I are invited on this day by Jesus to name the scary things. Yes, it can be troubling. Yes, it can be upsetting. When markets take a tumble or when people's jobs change and your family arrangements look different than they did a year ago or as we all <laughs> get reaccustomed to what the new normal will look like as we move forward through post-COVID life, we hope. In the midst of all that, we're called to be people. We are invited to be people who dare to trust what Jesus is up to in the world, not destroying it or breaking it, but making all things new as he mends and puts
puts pieces back together that were meant to be whole in the first place. What if this week you dared to live your life in a way that made people scratch their heads and wonder how delightfully, blessedly out of step you are because you are ahead of the curve that way? That's the invitation for you and for me this day, sisters and brothers. Jesus is making all things new. Amen. For a song of the day today, we want to invite you to join in a new song that is easily singable and easily learned after a verse. Marge and I are going to, again, if you're willing, we'll do one verse through first, and then we'll invite you to join in. If there's any other special musicians who want to join us, this is your chance as well, special musicians. But this song is called Love is on the Way. You'll notice basically every verse has uh, the, the basic same structure. Love is on the way, then hope is on the way, peace is on the way, and joy is on the way. So here's your learning verse, and then we'll all join in and talk. Ready, March?
On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In the midst of our needs and those of the world, let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Each petition in our prayers today ends with the words, Lord, in your mercy, and you're invited to respond and hear our prayer. God of new creation, we dare to trust your promises that you are making all things new. And so we ask on this day that you would keep us, your faithful people, vigilant, awake, and alert to use each moment of our lives to live in light of your coming day. We pray that you would make our hearts compassionate and loving, that you would make our hands willing and dedicated to serve and love, that you would make our feet willing to go into our neighborhoods and around the world as living embodiments of your good news. Lord, in your mercy, Lord of all nations, we trust that you are indeed sovereign over all creation, and we await the fullness of the coming of your reign, your kingdom in all places. But in this time, in this meantime experience of our lives, we pray for you to be at work through the leaders of nations in all places, that they would be guided with a concern for the common good, for justice and for peace for all, that they would lead with wisdom and with diligence, and that all people would live safely and free from fear. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the ministry of this congregation in these days and of neighboring congregations, that here in the communities where you have placed us, we would embody your good news in our words and in our actions as we seek to serve our local communities, as we seek to be witnesses in our day-by-day -day lives. Help us to be living embodiments of the hope of your coming. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We lift up to you on this day, Lord God, all those who are troubled or sick in body, in mind, and in spirit, or with special needs and concerns. We lift up to you and name before you Dave, Bob, Sharon, Margie. We ask your traveling mercies on all who are traveling in these coming days after the Thanksgiving holiday. We celebrate with Carla on her birthday. We lift up to you as well, too, in this space, those we name out loud or silently in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, we give you thanks too, Lord God, that in your promise for new creation, there is the promise of resurrection and reunion with all those who have gone before us. We give you thanks for the lives of those who have gone before us, those who have shown us your love and embodied hope for us, and for your promise that we will be gathered with them in your resurrection feast that has no end. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we give all these prayers, names, and needs, along with all those whose names and needs we do not know, trusting in your deep mercy through your Son who came into our midst, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. You're invited to share a sign of Christ's peace. Let us pray. God of abundance, you cause streams to break forth in the desert and manna to rain from the heavens. Accept the gifts you have first given us. Unite them with the offering of our lives to nourish the world you love so dearly. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. 
We listen to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, to give our thanks and praise to you, O God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. You comforted your people with the promise of the Redeemer, through whom you will also make all things new in the day when he comes to judge the world in righteousness. And so, with all the choirs of angels, the church on earth, and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn.
congregation rises as you are able. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks for having fed us at your table with this meal of your new creation, fed by Jesus' own presence with us. Strengthen us to be your witnesses in the world into which you send us, as we pray these things in his name. Here in our midst, the living Christ has come, the living God has embraced us in love, and the living Spirit has refreshed us to be people of hope and messengers of good news. We are now we are sent into the midst of the world, world still thinking for that good news, and, and so we call on God to bless us for the journey. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. We sing as our sending song for the evening, Christ be our light.
serve the Lord.